um, a reaction from the trustees of campuses because the prices just skyrocket. And so now they, all they want is Georgian architecture. So we were out with Neomo, we we're out with Georgian just the same way. And finding this carefully thought through response to a situation becomes even harder. The side of the room, please, someone. Students, your opportunity. No, your obligation. That's, <laughs> that's part of the deal. Any of you? Should we put it? Should we put the images up on the on the wall? Let's do that. What, can we turn those on, Nick? <coughs> we have. Uh, I think we have nine or ten images that have come in overnight. Jamie, are you here? Please stand up. We've asked them to each select, to, to basically select one image and with the difficult task of a single image in portfolios that by this time of the year have a few hundred pages in them, I'm sure. Um, maybe show what you're currently thinking and, uh, and describe it in a form where it might become a kind of question that we could get some feedback. Can, can I apologize to you for making you select one image? On the other hand, in real life, you're going to have to do things like yeah. that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, the brief for the, this project for my unit was to create a new system of architectural ornament. Uh, we were able to select from three museums around London. Uh, this was the National Gallery, which is my brief. It was to create a, a system of architectural ornament for a rooftop extension to the National Gallery, so not, you know, replacing, similar to the same that we're doing. Uh, but the idea was that, you know, I took the existing classicist uh, ornamental vocabulary of the National Gallery, and I examined it in terms of its symbolism, meaning, genealogy, and then rendered it in a contemporary light. Uh, the way I did this was not by directly quoting the sculptural objects, but after examining them, expanding on certain readings that you can have of these ornamental motifs. And then these are very contemporary readings and in a sense processing these figurative objects into new figurative ornament. And so this, for example, takes the petrification of an acanthus leaf and turns that into almost a, a process which, which becomes the fossilization of this acanthus leaf. Oh, sorry. All right. So an acanthus leaf, for example, which is usually rendered as kind of a stylized, foliated uh, uh, ornament as a relief, is taken as a very realistic image, which is then taken through the processes of folding and petrification uh, associated with fossilization. And then this renders a new surface, uh, which is a continuation of the acanthus motif as, uh, as a metaphorical petrification as an ornament, but it changes the, you know, the actual ornament. And this is a way of maybe discussing how you can continue meaning in ornament. Maybe you could consider still historical ornament, but somehow it's a contemporary reading. This was done uh, to several very s standard, uh, deliberately standard ornamental motifs, like the acanthus leaf, the Corinthian capital, the very standard Roman swag. And they were all taken and, and read, and these readings expanded on. And this, well, the, the, the objective of this was to create this maybe not, not a collage of just quoting, sorry, ornaments or, or sculpt sculptural forms, but then somehow rereading them or, you know, redressing them somehow. But take us more literally through Paper yes. Swag. Do we see exactly where it ended up? Where's the swag? Oh. The swag is, for example, this. It's usually seen as this. It's a relief uh, impressed onto a building. Uh, what I did was examine it as almost a kind of a micro history of folding and unfolding sections. These sections somehow become a line 
that's a new reading of this swag. It's a very, I kind of chose very simple examples within my project because they were better for an image. But then this, then this becomes a new, <laughs> this becomes a new ornament, and then it can be, and then this line can be reread as a profile in very, in in kind of several examples within the building, and it can be transformed into kind of a new cloth-like surface. Uh, something similar happened to the Corinthian capital, where whereas the as a sculptural object, it's something very symmetrical, balanced, placed at regular intervals along a facade. It's reread in terms of kind of appearing and decaying with uh, the, the rhythmic patterns of, of sunlight which render this object. And more and more uh, distortions appear as you, as you examine it in terms of yearly distortions in sun patterns and this can become a new idea of, of a Corinthian capital as so, maybe so a rhythm. So bring it around to a question yeah. for Bob and Denise <laughs> to help them as critics who have one image in a few minutes to see, to see the work. Right. What's the question on the table uh, where you are on the project now? All right. Uh, this was made uh, somewhat as a response to the Sainsbury wing, which takes the ornamental objects, uh, quotes them, and then regulates how they're applied with certain distortions. Uh, this project was saying, can we go beyond that by somehow reading these ornamental motifs, finding a way in which that guides a process by which they're transformed into a different form altogether. And this could be a new way of considering historical ornament. Is a question mark coming from this? Uh, <laughs> could this We're getting to the could question mark. Be? Yes. Yes, could exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I, I have a whole pile to say about that. Yeah. Bob, do you want to say something? <laughs> 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 the, first, the first thing is <coughs> we trace that process, which I showed you um, in, in the lecture, well, say from Mount Vernon to the developer house. And we have many ways in which we've, we called it hot imagery, cool imagery, and cold imagery. The cheaper it got, the more, the more the imagery got inaccurate and the colder it got. Now, this is a very down-to-earth example of something that you're doing. And it was very fascinating to follow that series of adaptations to make it affordable by people and acceptable by them. And some of the ones d done by our students were amazing, very much um, tongue-in-cheek, but very interesting and fun. Um, Bob did the same thing with our furniture because he took um, you know, Sheraton and Heppelwhite and um, Chippendale and he thought of it made in a press in plywood, and he took the three-dimensional quality of the de decoration, turned it on its side and made it flat, able to be simulated by a jigsaw in great complexity in one dimension and flat in the others. And that was a similar thing, producing an object, and then you can uh, evaluate whether you like the object regardless of what its source was. And then that's the final point to say, through art history, people have been turned on by the weirdest of things. You know, Furness took a dog's face and used that for um, formalized ornament. And so there's many things that turn you on. And my usual reaction to the source is, whatever turns you on just fine, let's not evaluate that. Let's evaluate what you did with it and whether it works or not, whether it can be built, whether it has meaning for people who are not going to know the process you went through. So that's another way of saying it. What resulted for you out of that, and is that something that um, is convincing to you, convincing to your colleagues? You're allowed to communicate with your peers as well as to everyone else, and the communication doesn't have to be all on one level. You can have an in-joke with other architects if you want to, so long as you're not trashing everyone else in the joke, and so long as it may makes sense to other people on other levels. So, you know, what you haven't told us is what that's made of, what it's doing. Is that a pattern on the building? Is it a skyscraper made in that shape? Or what is that thing? Uh, not, okay. to, not to be answered here. We're going to okay. move to the next image. Thank you for that, Denise. Bob, anything on this one before we go to the next? Nick, thank you. Kyle, I saw Kyle back here. Come on up. Quickly. 
He's making the long route around the room. Have a seat. Okay. So, uh, part of the MTech graduate program, we focus on aggregation. If you could grab the microphone yeah. there. So, we focus on aggregation, which is a natural process. You see aggregation in the way that landscapes form. In the way cities form. Exactly. So, uh, our, pro our project focused on three components. One was 30 centimeters, one was 60 centimeters, and one was 90 centimeters. And we took these pieces and created a pneumatic form, put that underneath these wooden aggregates, poured them on top, and then removed the pneumatic form. And what you got was a completely friction-based structural system. Go through that again so we understand it. <laughs> Okay. Point, point to what you were doing quite specifically. Okay. Actually, yeah. Okay, so each one of these pieces was about 90 centimeters, 60 centimeters, and even I think over here you can see one, one right there, a 30 centimeter piece. Every single one of these pieces was made like this. You can see two laid on and the third one was brought in. And that joint itself was structural. And that's my meeting place. And that's your meeting place. Yes. All of these pieces were free, completely free, and this is a completely chaotic mm -hmm. system. So once they were all poured together, the only thing holding them together was their points of friction. How were they poured together? Um, a pneumatic structure was put on put underneath this, and it was just made out of white trash bags. We created a duct-taped pneumatic system that was a basic air fo formwork. And then on top of that, these were poured. They were placed slash poured um, completely randomly. Now, wait, you had little sticks of a certain size. In what sense were they poured? They were like fiddle sticks chucked? Or sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, that, that was about as precise as our pouring was for the moment. And then they're fashioned somehow? No, not, not at all. This is, this is completely friction-based. None of this is glued. It's just... Okay. Completely, fr it's like standing on sand. And so the question we're getting to is. So the question we're getting to is, if you had to use this in your own work, <laughs> <laughs> how would you do it? That's why I put it, I put it indoors because it wouldn't keep the rain out. <laughs> you should see it keep rain out. It actually. It, if there's enough of it, it actually directs the rain mm -hmm. along the uh, the branching pattern within the system. So it's 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 like trees. I mean, yeah, in the shadow, you see all those uh, you know, exactly holes. <laughs> 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 but don't forget, architecture does involve shelter. <laughs> About that, I like that. A dull frog. I would think one of the questions around it has to do with the idea of an aggregate form or structure. Mm -hmm. as, as Denise is saying, it's one of, the com one of the points that she was making about cities. She was thinking about aggregation at a different scale in the discussion of the, uh, some of the planning work last yes. night. And then we talk about, when you think about <coughs> aggregation and agglomeration, which is the pouring of one thing on top of another, um, things change as they get bigger. Yours would eventually huh. have a structural problem that would ensure that you had to make some part of it stronger in some way or all of it stronger in some way and whether you would go to uh, some kind of frame structure where the, the major forces were taken with certain members and the others were lighter or they made them all stronger would depend on the size. So um, I would be asking how increasing in increase of scale would affect the aggregation would be one of the ways of thinking about it. Um, I'd also say to just plain ordinary people of creating an arcade which suggested streaky bacon style and gothic aspiration was probably more understandable than walking under a pile of fiddlesticks. But for kids in the playground, the fiddlesticks may be more enjoyable. Thank you. Next, who else, who else do we have? Raul, do we, do we have... Yeah, there he is. Uh, I'm from Landscape Urbanism Program, and the agenda was to actually uh, find new terms in which the existing agricultural lands in the Pearl Delta region engages with the sprawling states 
it's part of the as part of the organization that is happening in 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 china so this image is actually generated by coupling uh, urban and natural relations maybe just say briefly what the image is yeah the, what are we looking at the on image the is a coupling of uh, urban and natural relations which which we will see the agricultural networks getting infused wi with the existing uh, urban road structure to actually form a kind of a liquefaction of networking so that we can generate a kind of a agricultural alchemy and propose a kind of urban ecology within within the site here. So, so, so these are the red road networks, yeah, basically. The, yeah, the white ones are the road net networks, and yes. the red ones are these eg uh, existing agricultural network networking on the land. Well, what is an agricultural network? Give me an example. Like, like the irrigation lines or the, or the dikes that are made within, within the agricultural parcels, which we tend to overlook in most times in urbanism when these yes. sprawling is happening. So we try to engage the, the sprawl with these kind of agricultural networking. And these are not actually a movement system, but they are well, a protection system. Sometimes the dikes actually are movement systems over which, I mean, there, there's a canal and there are dikes on which you move. So yes. th these act as uh, the pedestrian axis is yes. in between these areas. Can you see the tie in, in this to what um, Patrick Geddes was doing that I showed, taking, uh, looking at these same kinds of patterns mm -hmm. and trying to understand them and and their, their role in the future. Yeah. Yes. yes. So what my question was is that if if the notion of landscape urbanism that is coming up, whether it strives towards a resistance to the present globalization of the way urbanism is dealt with. Or whether it State moves. State that again. Yeah. The, uh, the notion of landscape urbanism, which actually functions with urban and natural relations, whether it's, whether it's like a resistance to globalization. That's a big question. It's, it's hard to know if it's resistance. You'll, you'll notice that we have, we have talked about sustainability and natural determinants of form that have to be understood at the same time as other determinants. Um, Ian McHarg at Penn introduced this way of thinking, and I was disappointed in him because he evolved those uh, many determinants of form in that way, but he could not imagine the melding of those with, say, industrial yeah. ones. He said, those are very worthy too, but I'm not interested. Well, it's no use being sectional. Mm -hmm. I, in the end, if the, if the one's to survive, it has to recognize the other. And you could say that the urbanization trends are global, but I'm not so sure how useful that is. Um, let me give you an example. I flew into Iran at 3 o'clock one morning to attend a conference. This is 1977. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, coming from New York, they served us Coca-Cola. And I said, do you think we Americans are that crazy that we drink <coughs> Coca-Cola at 3 in the morning? And they said, no, but we Iranians do. <laughs> For them, Coca-Cola was their thing, and they were going to drink it when they liked, thank you. And so it may be that people here would eventually say, McDonald's is our, yeah. our thing. You may have invented, but we're going to make it our own the way we want. So <coughs> it might be better to look at the actual systems, and it's, they may have come from a global um, influence. They may be useful, or they may be not useful. They may be harmful and need to be protected. They may have to be altered. That may be the more legitimate question. This is very beautiful, though, and it's very evocative. It makes you think of all sorts of things, and that's what mapping can do. And using mapping and the laws it's um, suggesting for design is much better than just picking up a global pattern or, or a, 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 a computer-generated pattern somewhere and using it as sculpture. So finding and understanding it and seeing how it will deal with the real problems that this area is facing would be a very good direction. Thank you, Rahul. We have a few more, I think. Let's, uh, Nick, let's go to the next and see. Is Alma here? Please, join us. Hey. Um, what else I um, I'm from uh, Intermediate 10, and um, our unit's agenda, the main title was Narrative Infrastructure. And um, this, uh, this is um, produced uh, from last um, phase, which was to program programmatically using diagrams, using drawings, using models to figure <coughs> out what sort of program we want to implement. And the brief was uh, focused on the general theme of production. And 
more importantly, this idea of frugality. And how can we, in a moment of abundance, bring back um, frugality in the way we live? And uh, we are encouraged to take personal approaches. And for me, the project was rooted on a series of uh, literature, especially a series of book, which uh, was on the history of private life. I was really interested in this idea of um, bringing back our domestic sphere, which is creating this increasing distance uh, from factories, from production. How do we Could loop? Talk to the part of the that might explain this. this um, yeah. How do I loop, for example, a simple household here, conceptually represented, back into something that's productive? And the main idea, the program uh, which came out was a, a waste farm. Because if we think of uh, our family now, our household, the only thing we actually produce, instead of it being a household um, factory or a household production unit, is waste. And this is, I mean, I personally think this is an issue, especially in the next coming years, we must deal. Instead of putting things directly into landfill, we need a systematic infrastructure within the city that can um, accommodate all these um, demands on waste. And we also need to learn how to live beside this ugly, stinky, smelly rubbish. So the idea of uh, the project was to bring directly um, from the household via um, a me mechanical system on the facade and into the site, which if you look at this sort of conceptual section here, the rubbish will be collected on the very top because, <laughs> I mean, another agenda <coughs> for the project was You want to bring this towards a question for the critics. Yeah. Okay, and, um, and then the waste gets transferred down to the main site area, which is a compost area, and that gets feeds into allotments, which will be lented to families around the site. And I suppose my question is, um, I, I think my question is fear, think, draw, and make. Um, I know you talk a lot about functional, functionalism, um, which is sort of, I believe, your, you think architecture should be extremely functional. But my question is, uh, where do you see architecture as a language and as a way to not only to become a built product, but rather it be sort of something that's effective as writing, as, as art, as a piece of painting? And how do you feel about that personally? Because I think our unit is sort of this interdisciplinary, really kind of hybrid approach to architecture. And yeah, that's, that, that's, I think that's a very good question. Can I tell you a little story also? I was on a jury at Tsinghua University. Now those students are great and they all speak English and they, it's <laughs> wonderful. And they were so good with computers. And this one young woman, her project and her thesis was um, wastewater management. I said, are you treating it as a scientific discipline or as an artistic discipline? She said, as an artistic discipline. So I think that's a very, it's a, that's just what you've told me now <laughs> too, that you are interested in the communication part here and mm -hmm. the artistry about it. Now, I think functionalism was one of the glories of early modern architecture, but I, you've heard me say it has to be reassessed, redefined, and again, in that redefinition, um, we, we can take the earlier view which said um, the beauty comes out of solving the functional problem. And we know that people said that, but they did something different. And we know that there's always a lot of contradiction between um, what they say and what they feel. I nevertheless believe that seeing the artistic thing as deeply, deeply important, but also a by byproduct, is the healthiest way for us. Because otherwise, we tend to not only distort function, which is not not a very good thing sometimes, but we just we tend to do the same old aesthetics over and over, and we we lose our chance for freshening our view. So, for all of those reasons, um, I still think seeing beauty as a byproduct even though we know it's a false sentiment to some extent, is a healthy one. Mm -hmm. Does that help? I just wanted to say one other thing. You talked about you're trying by these studies to devise a program, yeah. and that's interesting too, because architects think of the brief as coming first. Yeah. And I 
point to say that the first brief is not always the last brief because the functions change all over. But planners think of the program as coming yeah. last. So you put the program where the planner would say it's a good idea to put it. Now, I haven't Thanks. understood everything you, you're Emma. doing, but I think it is very fascinating. And if you're trying also to devise an artistic discipline out of it, I think that's spot on. But if you do it at the expense of the function and at the expense mm -hmm. of the science, I think that would be wrong too. Thank you. Th thank you, Alma. Next one up. Alma, may mention just one more time, which unit are you from? Intermediate three. Thank you. Ricardo and Nanette. I think the number changed in the last few minutes. <laughs> I'm glad you got that out there. Good. Uh, next one, we have S Silvana here. Yeah, good. Sorry, we've just got a few minutes left. I don't want to take too much of their busy day today. So it'd be nice to get the next. I think we've only got maybe three, three or four others. But Let me so warn Bob Venturi. Bob, I'm going to button my lips and I'm not going to say a single <laughs> word. This puts the pressure so on. You Mrs. Just be Thatcher is going to do the talking. <laughs> no, no, you. This no, no. is the last one, and people have a right to hear from you. They heard from me yesterday. I'll, I'll try and be as succinct and to the point. Um, so our unit, the, the brief of our unit was to consider the notion of dwelling um, and to do that through narrative. So what we're looking at here is a model that I made of a circulation of a new public realm. Sorry? So this, um, this is in the city of London. Uh, so St. Paul's is somewhere over here. And what I proposed is to make a new public realm through the circulation which runs through the existing building. So it runs from the fire escapes, which are these uh, red points here of existing buildings, up through the circulation and up onto the roofscapes of the, of the building. So the project is a public bath which is organized around this found circulation within the city as a way to activate and provoke a new public domain. And the agenda is to create this, this public domain, which I understand as the potential of an encounter with the other within the city of London. So to, to give a really uh, quite to the point question, um, one thing that you've discussed a lot is this issue of context, which is something that I find very interesting. My question about context is what, what happens when we, when we look at context and think that in order to move forward, we do actually have to subvert it. We have to not necessarily take something that is already there, but actually put something in that would unsettle a kind of strictness or tendency that an area already has. Um, is that something, is that, well, how do you see that? Well, I think very often uh, acknowledging context and, and de uh, dealing with context, uh, you have to kind of not acknowledge the context in terms of connecting with it too explicitly. Mm -hmm. There are moments when is just a very a revolutionary change uh, as opposed to an evolutionary yep. change. And so I, I said somewhere that the contra contrast in, uh, 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 um, um, context involves contrast as well mm. as uh, analogy. And uh, so I just think that's very significant. And there are moments when there's this enormous difference. The view ready is uh, next to old Paris, uh, the, the, the famous uh, drawing is, is an example of that. And that can make sense. But there are also moments when it makes sense to kind of fit in in terms of form and uh, symbolism. So it really just depends on the particular um, circumstance. Next one. Let me see if we have another one or two. Uh, Amadine, I don't think I saw her here. Next, after. Hami and Chen. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> oh, they're right there. No, both of you are right over here. Use that mic. Okay. Sit, sit with Bob and Denise for a minute. Yeah. Do you have two two people, or yeah, so do, you want, do you want to use mom? I like to speak more mom. Right. So hi there, and it's uh, I'm Tomasa, and I'm Chen. And we are from Interline, we are TVC. And uh, that's an image we select for today from our project. Um, what you see here, uh, this is a drawing of the Urban Fabric in between Plaza Diamant, 
let me point it to you. It's the of the urban fabric knees uh, between uh, the uh, Plaza Plaza Diamant and uh, at the very very end going towards uh, Plaza La Bassaria Central and uh, in, B in Barcelona is in the district of Gracia and this year uh, as a project we're doing a market building. This uh, drawing is uh, uh, being composed by a uh, collaging technique inspired by Ed Rocher and David Ochney, as you might see here and up there. Honey, are you understanding? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's difficult to understand your accent for him. I'm okay, it's okay. Right. Uh, in and, and so the question that the drawing is pointed to then is it very very good? Well the question is that uh, substantially as you can see here what we did, we uh, did an analysis of that portion of our site considering um, putting an attention towards the surfaces of the city and trying to mark out in this color coded uh, legend in within this uh, this very funny uh, mesh that you can see here is traced from the individual perspective lines that the photograph study suggested and this in the middle right here is the street that we recorded and this Where is, is the that street on this diagram is the gray part okay so gray is for street gray is for street what is yellow then yellow is for uh, interesting points in the openings on onto the facades as marking uh, lighting points at night where the windows were lighted up or not and where uh, for example you have uh, more intensity which is the bright yellow and less intensity which is dark orange and then we uh, analyze the parking area which is this blue mark that you see in here and we analyze uh, some relevant um, point about the uh, commercial activities taking place along, along this uh, portion of the street in red and the green is at the very, very end is the green, the green areas or the presence of greenery that you can find along the street. Um, so the you say that that yellow will not be part of the street side. Exactly, because this, this dimension of the street is very narrow, but in, in within this narrow street, you have a lot that is fitting in programmatic wise. As you can see, like parking for bike and scooters, then you have commercial activities, and then you have this whole um, program about light and signage too. And let me ask you a question. It's a pretty one, and it could be evocative, but wha in what way does it give you more or different information than the photograph? I think that uh, in a way for us, uh, we were looking at um, another way to translate the surface that you could experience here in the photograph and you can uh, abstract it and um, find uh, another way to compose uh, ultimately another surface in terms that would be able to deliver to you something to uh, work on uh, later on on the project. So, so for example, when I showed the desire lines, which were, they didn't exist any more than what you did, and they gave me, in that case, not always, but in that case, the basis That's the question I wanted to ask you. <laughs> exactly. <Excellent. laughs> In terms that, unfortunately, um, that means the drawing communicated perfectly. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's the question. In terms that uh, later on, Brad, in, in the project, what we drive the project forward, you can s you, you don't see in this image, is by using other drawing languages, and that's the brief and the agenda of the unit while exploring different languages get to resolve uh, in within uh, the aspect of surfaces uh, an architectural project towards the end of the year. So the sad thing for us is that we didn't have actually any way to, f to find uh, um, a, a system to fit this mapping into our project and in our site. The idea is that what we, what we came up with is a sort of landscape surface that will provide the 
um, the, as an agent to uh, give back to the city the lost square of the La Brasseria Central by removing the existing mass because in the site at the moment there is a huge blockage at the market that is in there is shutting out the old square and so for us the intervention will be about removing that and giving back to the district of Grasse which has a um, very interesting um, urban planning involved uh, in it this, uh, this lost square that the market is taken over over the years and we would like to give it back certain project will be one set and another project will be another. But <coughs> I just have a strong intuition that if I will look at these and overlap them and develop them, they will be the, the relevant ones for my problem. And I think that's on Beachley Hill. When you look at the shore and you look at your problem in Barcelona, to pick something that will make it easier for you to get to a resolution of the real problems and the real design solutions I think that's a question of, of growing experience with doing projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I'm This year our unit project is about university as well. But uh, here, these two minutes I'm putting on here is not the product, the byproduct of my design, but it's the reference I'm looking up, I'm working with. So it's basically the circle and square has been the traditional Chinese courtyard house that has been huge influence in not forming the ba basic singular housing time, but also the city strategy. And uh, our unit agenda is to um, challenge the university campus by being um, sort of nested on the outskirts of, of the city now acquire scale concentration and ambition to become a city itself. So um, my aim of the design is to create a compact, a sort of a highly differentiated courtyard um, configuration to accommodate both the city and the university program um, within a limited and legible boundary. But here, um, the question I'm putting on the table is, um, on what degree do you take in the culture um, counter reference or the um, even, I would say, to the extreme of uh, maybe superstitious of the local sort of um, uh, local culture, basically. Mm. If you design on putting a building on the in country, which is not your homeland, how mm. much uh, towards which degree do you take into this culture thing as a context? Thanks for coming in last night. <laughs> and so we didn't want to produce a madam butterfly. So yeah, we needed that kind of well, consultation. Fine, it's right. just wonderful to do that, and the result has been a, a mixture. So yeah, I think exactly that's true. Exactly. Now exactly. we're also faced with no, the reality of the cost of the construction. A nice and another and experience we had was in the 1960s yeah. working with young activists, yes, exactly. African Americans, who yeah. wanted to no, bring in inner city areas. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Delta had already attacked the law as against schools, with the women of African queens in sheets, tablecloths, curtains, in response to this growing advertising of amongst African Americans at that time. So there were already the much cheaper ways of doing it, but doing it now much much cheaper. Thanks for coming in for it. It's nice. We'll catch up soon. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Well, they've charged us for the time. Totally fascinating. I see things. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, we're going to do one last, one last image. Kanto, why don't you come up? I realize we're running a bit into lunchtime, so this will be the last image of the set. Kanto? Um, hi, I'm Kanto, um, Diploma 11. What, what, yes, sorry, the image basically shows a collage of the models I've been making for the last couple of months. Is, and the models... Um, basically represent a type of a water infrastructure that I'm intending to insert into the King's Cross redevelopment in order to um, stitch the local condition and the new development that happens at the site over the canal, the region's canal. And, uh, By using the property, so okay, like now show us how you um, it doesn't really show the context at all. It's basically the thing I'm interested in is the 
the power of using the te technique of collaging and uh, somehow the, the, m the models are based on the context that surrounds it, so they're products of that. But yeah, when they, um, for, so for, for instance, like <laughs> the sea that stuff, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the water is running, so water is running on, like, on, you see just that white bit. Imagine that there's a canal over there. And, and then the water is being taken from the, lo the level difference and then flows into the canal and then the formwork underneath which is the formwork of the concrete surface that goes above and then the space in between can create a sort of, sort of spatial condition that could provide a new context to the surrounding programs around it. So the early programs turned on that no, 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 no. It's just uh, say if there's an excavation that happens in order to place this concrete surface into the ground, but then there's the n there's going to be a formwork that lies underneath, and I'm I'm trying to explore ways to how to reuse the formwork as well as the surface of the concrete to achieve spaces that could but happen that's underneath. The underneath. Yeah, yeah, yes, basically, yeah, and the water flows from here. Okay, so let me explain to you from my point of view. Yeah. You are dealing with a urban infrastructure problem yeah. to do with water and containers of water and things which are going to be built. These shapes are going to be maybe the ones you've shown me, maybe other ones, but they will always have a formwork under and a set of uneven shapes not controlled by you above. And you're trying to get out of those in-between spaces some kind of civic structure that helps link things. Exactly. I think yeah. that's a very interesting idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you have to learn to say all those things I said yeah. to make you <laughs> understand. Um, I think working on it. A place where the water is <coughs> blue, it would make it very much clearer. Yes. <laughs> um, so, thanks for <laughs> that. <laughs> my, my question was, can I ask Do a question? Basically, what's your take about form of collage? Is like I read the book about collage city and uh, recombinant urbanism, and basically, I think collaging is appears somehow optimistic, but then again, it has the layering of different programs can only be seen, or like the condition that happens in between can only be seen after doing that collage. And Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming in today. Bob and Denise, thank you so much for the session and for the fantastic visit the last couple of days and to be here in London and the AA all week. Uh, everybody, thanks for the students. Thank you for bringing an image in and for provoking the conversation. Uh, this will bring the session to a close. Please join me in thanking Denise Scott Brown and Robert Ventura.